Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Before we start analyzing today's The Hindu newspaper, two important announcements. Number one, your weekly economy lecture that covers past week's business newspapers. This lecture shall be available on our YouTube channel by tomorrow 10 p.m. Second, the controversy surrounding ILNFS. On this controversy, a video lecture has just been recorded and this video lecture shall also be available on our YouTube channel in two to three days. Also, there is an editorial on this controversy in today's newspaper. This video lecture shall factor in that editorial as well. Now, let's jump into this newspaper analysis, beginning with a very important news on page number one of the Delhi edition of the Hindu that is relevant for your GS paper two, which talks about international relations. Saudi Arabia promises to meet India's oil needs. Now let's understand the background of this newspaper article and let's also understand the significance of the statement coming from the Saudi Arabia. Now we know United States and Iran they have a conflict between them. United States is accusing Iran of developing a nuclear bomb. Iran declines this accusation. But what United States is also doing, United States is pressurizing those countries which are dealing with Iran. And United States is pressurizing these countries that you should snap your business ties with Iran or minimize it to a much, much lesser level as possible. One such country is India as well. United States is asking India that you should limit your imports from Iran. This we get to know from the newspaper reports as well as the statements released by the US state officials. But India is dependent upon Iran for its crude oil needs. In fact, Iran is one of the three largest exporters of crude oil to India, the other two being the Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Now, Iran, since it is one of the largest supplier of crude oil to India and India is heavily dependent on Iran for its energy needs, India is trying to reason to United States that we cannot snap all the ties with Iran because we are dependent on Iran. Now, let's look at the statement. This statement is significant because Saudi Arabia is trying to signal to India that whatever shortfall you may feel, if you try to snap ties with Iran, we will factor that in and we will ensure that you do not suffer from the lack of crude oil if the ties between Iran and India are snapped. That is why this statement becomes very, very important. But now let's look at something else. There are various analysts who are saying that there is a problem between the Arab world and Iran. There are problems within the Arab world as well, what we call intra-Arab problems. For example, the problems or the disputes between Saudi Arabia and Turkey, the dispute between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. So these are intra-Arab disputes. We will not touch them because that is not the matter of concern right now. But what about the dispute between Arab world and Iran? And we also have to understand that here Arab world is significantly led by the Saudi Arabia. So should we say it is the dispute between the Saudi Arabia and Iran? Saudi Arabia, Sunni dominated, Iran, Shia dominated nation. There are various analysts in India who are saying that we should support politically, diplomatically this Arab world pressure group and not Iran. Why? Because the benefits of having good relationship with this Arab bloc far outweighs the benefits that we can get from Iran. Why? Let's try and understand that. Number one, if you look at the Arab world, we look at Bahrain, we look at UAE, we look at Qatar, we look at Kuwait, we look at Saudi Arabia, for example. Bulk of India's remittances, they come from this Arab world section. 
That means the Malayalis who go to the Gulf, they send large parts of their savings back into India. And when they send dollars back to the India, ultimately it is better and fruitful for the Indian economy. Iran does not offer that potential to India. In fact, there are other areas coming up, which are the hubs of innovation, which are the hubs of technology in this section of the Arab world. That means the promise that this section provides to India far outweighs the promise or far outweighs the benefits that can be given by the Iran to India. That is why we should lean in favor of this block and not Iran. Another important thing that you need to understand is that Ministry of External Affairs, it deals with the international diplomacy of India with different countries of the world. And in this Ministry of External Affairs, there are two units that deal with the Middle East or that deal with Southeast Asia. One is the Gulf unit. The other is PAI unit. Gulf unit is neglected and the foreign ministries officials foreign service officials they are mostly concentrated on this pia block and what is this pia pakistan afghanistan and iran that means our bureaucracy our foreign service officers have been trained since our independence that much more emphasis should be provided to this block rather than the gulf unit that needs to be changed now and that is what Indian Express also talks about in today's newspaper that we should seriously consider the benefits or the opportunities that this Arab world bloc provides to India rather than Iran because Iran's economy is crippling. Iran except the crude oil and the cultural exchanges they don't offer much to India than what is offered by this Arab world bloc. But there are others who say, no, we should still con continuously try and have good relationship with Iran because Iran is our entry, is our gateway to the Middle East. And Iran plays a very important role in Afghanistan as well. And if we need a footmark in Afghanistan, we need to have good relations with Iran as well. We can't dump them at this point in time. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Primarily what Saudi Arabians are saying that we promised to meet India's oil needs. But for that, we had to look at the larger geopolitical equation, which is concerning with United States, which is concerning Iran as well. That is what, what you need to understand from the civil services examination point of view. Now, let's look at another issue. The Me Too storm that is storming the social media right now. Minister of External Affairs, MJ Akbar, more than 14 women have come out and spoken about the sexual harassment meted out to them by MJ Akbar, who is a celebrated writer as well as a journalist. Now, what MJ Akbar has done, he has slapped a defamation suit against one of the journalists, Miss Ramani, Priya Ramani, to be more precise. But this is irrelevant for your examination. Who slapped defamation case against whom? Nobody is going to ask you this. But what you need to understand from the civil services examination point of view, that defamation in India is both a civil wrong as well as a crime. And what is the difference between civil wrong and criminal wrong? We have discussed in these webinars twice in the past. But the larger question from the mains point of view is, should defamation be a criminal wrong? Criminal wrong is a wrong that you commit against the state, wrong that you commit against the society. If MJ Akbar has felt violated or if he has felt defamed, it should have been a dispute between two individuals. It should have been a civil wrong. Why does defamation continue to be a criminal wrong in this country? That is what the debate is right now. In fact, there is a private member's bill pending in Indian Parliament, which tries to make defamation only as a civil wrong and not a criminal wrong in this country. That is what the matter of debate is right now and can be a potential question for your examination. Should defamation continue as the criminal wrong or not? The answer is clear. It should not be a criminal wrong at best. It can be a civil wrong between two individuals. 
if you are a anthropology student if your optional is anthropology then this newspaper article becomes very important for you pad women of telangana's tribal belt in telangana's tribal area since february 2018 tribal women or adivasi women they are running four small units and these units are manufacturing the sanitary napkins and these sanitary napkins are distributed freely to the students to the tribal students who are staying at hostels or schools or ashrams in telangana so this is another way of tribal emancipation this is another way of tribals helping themselves helping each other in this society and this is very important statement if you are an anthropology student please make note of this newspaper article and whenever tribal issue is asked in the examination you can incorporate these points as well india and france are in talks to conduct a tri service exercise now this is an ongoing negotiation between iran and france whether it will materialize or not we'll have to wait and watch but there is one important thing that you need to understand it's going to be a tri service exercise that means all the three services air force navy and army will take part in this exercise and in all likelihood a logistics agreement may also be signed between india and france this logistics agreement may be similar to the logistics agreement that india has already signed with united states so what is this logistics agreement very briefly since we have discussed this in the past as well if this logistics agreement is signed between india and france then all the france bases the bases that france has in different parts of the world different naval bases indian ships will get access to these bases they can dock at these bases for fuel requirements for replenishment so on and so forth and that is a very very important step in further strengthening the relationship between india and france if at all it materializes let's look at some of the editorials and columns from today's the hindu newspaper and apart from these three newspaper articles that we have discussed there is not much relevant information in today's newspaper the bhutan vote now who will win this election that is not a matter of concern for us but what is a matter of urgency for us is that the relationship that india has traditionally had with bhutan that should continue no matter who wins the election in bhutan but what this editorial talks about is that bhutan believes in gross national happiness where they measure the development of its nation not just by the economic criteria but also by the happiness sustainability by the effects that the development has on the national well-being of the people of bhutan and bhutan is celebrated throughout the world for its insistence that we will measure economy not only in economy parameters but in gross national happiness as well and if you have studied the economy lectures you will be much better acquainted with what are the various parameters of this gross national happiness but what we need to understand also is that there is one political party which has won all the seats in west bhutan and there are two political parties which have won only in east bhutan and now there is a divide west bhutan is developed east bhutan is less developed or least developed now which political formation will be in a position to form the government it will have another challenge in place one political party has all its base in the west part other two political outfits they have not won anywhere in the west but have won all their seats in east now it requires a reconciliation it requires statesmanship so that this divide between the west and the east is bridged by the new dispensation by the new government which will be in place in bhutan and the editorial says that no matter which political party forms the government in bhutan the relationship should only be strengthened between india and bhutan and in fact the friendship treaty of india and bhutan which will complete 50 years in 2018 
that will also be taken forward by the new government because Bhutan is heavily dependent upon the investment from India primarily in their hydroelectric power plants. And India is also benefited because of this. How? The surplus electricity that is generated by the hydroelectric power plants in Bhutan, that surplus is then exported to India and India is in a position to meet the electricity needs of its population. Now let's look at another important issue that is related to the Rafale controversy. Now what is a Rafale deal that we have already discussed in the past? And if you need to understand what this controversy is all about, just type Rafael by Jews IAS and you will be in a position to understand what this controversy is all about. But what this newspaper article talks about, this newspaper article primarily talks about that there should be transparency. Transparency whenever a nation is conducting transactions with a foreign country. What is the cost of the Rafael deal? What are the agreements signed between India and France? We don't know. Why? The government of India is saying that there was a 2008 agreement with France regarding the exchange and reciprocal protection of classified or protected information. That means whatever deal is conducted between India and France, the details of this deal should remain secret. Why? Let's say, for example, the deal, the Rafale deal between India and France, the French government, let's assume, was in a position to give a better deal to India for a variety of reasons. This deal should not be known in the public because then it will jeopardize the interest of France when they will deal with many other countries as well, because other countries will also want similar concessions, concessions, similar deals, similar discounts, for example, for their own contracts. That is why there is a secrecy clause. But Rakesh Sood, former diplomat, he says that the government of India should not hide behind this agreement of 2008 because the French president has already said if the government of India wants to release the details regarding the Rafael deal, we don't have a problem. When French government does not have a problem, why should Indian government hide the deal transactions or the details regarding the Rafael deal with the Indian public? And what Rakesh Sood is also alluding to is that maybe there will be a joint parliamentary committee and the probe or the investigation by joint parliamentary committee will reveal all the allegations against this controversy. Let's look at another issue, castles in the air. And let me try and make this newspaper column as simple as possible for you. The Nobel Prize in Economy was given to two individuals, William D. Nordhaus and Paul M. Romer. What is Mr. Romer famous for? He is famous for his concept called Charter Cities. What are these Charter Cities? Basically, there is a wasteland of a country. Let's say this is a wasteland of India. It is not developed at all. This land is lying vacant, has not been utilized by either the government of India or by any private player. Now, a charter city can be set up, can be constructed, can be developed in this wasteland and that too from scratch. But what will be the business opportunity for a private player? Why would a private player develop such a city? In this city or charter city, India will give up on its sovereignty. That means how this city will be administered, how this city will be handled, government of India will have no say in that. And this city will be constructed, schools will be constructed, hospitals, private players will be freely asked to come in and invest in this city. And ultimately, we can make world class cities because of this concept of charter city. And when the economy Nobel Prize is given to Mr. Romer, this can be a potential question in your examination. Is it time for India to also set up these charter cities? But this newspaper column by Mr. Matthew, 
he heavily criticizes this concept of charter city. Why he criticizes? He says that these charter cities goes against the basic principles of democracy and citizenship. Because the government of India will be in a position to give up its sovereignty on this piece of land. Why would it do so? It is against democracy. And the people who will be residing in these charter cities, they will have no say whatsoever how this city will be managed, how this city will be administered. Does it not go against the very concept of citizenship in modern democracies? That is why we should never pay heed to this idea that we should set up charter cities. That is what this column criticizes. But now one question might be on your minds. How are these charter cities different from, let's say, smart cities? Is that a question on your mind? Smart cities concept in India is slightly different. There are cities which are already there. Now we will enhance the facilities in these cities and we will make them smart. That means smart cities are different from charter cities. How? Charter cities will be developed from scratch. These smart cities, cities are already there. We just have to provide better waste, waste disposal facilities, better infrastructure in these cities. So we are upgrading these cities to the level that they can be called as smart cities. Whereas these charter cities are to be developed from scratch. And in fact, these smart cities are still within the sovereignty of India. These charter cities are beyond the sovereignty, beyond the control of its nation. That is how these charter cities and smart cities differ from each other. But look at the history of charter cities. Charter cities were attempted in Madagascar in 2008, but it failed. Charter cities were attempted in Honduras in 2012 as well, but it failed. Madagascar and Honduras and both these attempts failed. Let's look at the Indian attempt. There is a city, Lavasa city near Pune, which is developed by a private company, but it is still bogged down by the environmental legislations for many years. That means the city is not getting the environmental clearances. That means in India, the concept of private players developing a city, although not in the to the extent of developing it as a charter city because even in Lavasa the Indian rules will apply but this concept of developing private cities have met with disputes legal disputes legal wrangles and ultimately this concept has not been successful in India in fact the Dolera special investment region or gift city which was inaugurated by Prime Minister Modi as well when he was the when he initiated this when he was the Gujarat Chief Minister and later on inaugurated when he became the Prime Minister both these have not taken off yet in India that means even in India this concept of private players setting up cities it has not taken off well and what this column talks about is that such initiatives where people call for setting up of charter cities these initiatives should be challenged because these initiatives are ignorant and these initiatives must be met with resistance by the people in this country. Now let's look at another opinion page falling short on most counts. And this is a column on Ayushman Bharat. On Ayushman Bharat, we already have a video lecture available on our YouTube channel. Please go through that. In addition, let me tell you something that is not primarily covered in the video but is covered in this newspaper article and let's understand that. How does Ayushman Bharat fare when we compare it with the Obamacare? Or is insurance model better than universal health coverage? Because Schemes such as Ayushman Bharat, they are only for a particular section of the society. They are not for every single individual. And universal health coverage is for every single individual. Which is better? Insurance-based schemes such as Ayushman Bharat or universal health coverage? Let's have a brief idea about them. Let's say, for example, how does Obamacare compare with the Ayushman Bharat? 
Obama care was targeted at people in the age group of 18 to 64 and roughly it covered people 2 crore in number. There were 2 crore adults aged 18 to 64 covered under Obama care. What about Ayushman Bharat? It is going to cover 10 crore families. What is the budgetary allocation for Obama care? The budgetary allocation is 97,800 crore if we convert and use the exchange rate of 60 rupees for a dollar and what is the budgetary allocation now you will say that the cost of medical treatment in United States is much higher than in India even if we account that cost the budget for Obamacare is 489 crores because the medical cost or the difference in medical cost between India and the United States is close to 200 times. Now let's look at the Ayushman Bharat. If Ayushman Bharat is to cater to 10 crore people, then the budget should have been 12,225 crore, which is more than six times the current allocation of only 2,000 crore. So allocation for Ayushman Bharat is very, very poor, very, very poor. On top of that, there is another problem with insurance based schemes. How even insurance, even if you are insured, even if you have a medical insurance, this medical insurance does not cover your OPD visits, outpatients department visit. That means out of the pocket expenditure goes on increasing. That means when insurance does not cover majority or bulk of your hospitalization needs, then you have to spend money from your pocket. And in India, where only 1% is allocated, 1% of our GDP is allocated to public health, 65% of our health expenditure is out of pocket. That means 65% of the money that is spent for our health requirements, 65% of that is spent by the people out of their pocket where the government does not provide you with the money where the insurance companies don't reimburse that money and when in such a scenario where bulk of our expenditure is out of pocket it is time that we go for universal health coverage rather than insurance based schemes such as Ayushman Bharat that is what this newspaper column is basically stressing upon and please watch that video on Ayushman Bharat. All the details regarding the Ayushman Bharat scheme will be clear to you. Hamstringing the RTI Act, the fifth opinion column that we have to dis discuss today. And this article has been written by Sharad Sabarwal, who is a former diplomat as well as former Central Information Commissioner as well. Right to information is basically about two things transparency and this through this transparency you can also enforce accountability this movement started in Rajasthan in Rajasthan an organization asked the Rajasthan officials please give us the data please give us the details about how much money you have spent for some schemes in Rajasthan in absence of that data, in absence for all these details, we will not be in a position to enforce accountability. How would we know whether the government is working or not? For that, we need transparency in the system. We need to know how the governments are making decisions. We need to know where and how the money, which is public money, is being spent in this country. And that movement in Rajasthan led to the enactment of Right to Information Act in 2005 in India. Based on this RTI, you will get the information on the basis of a petition that you can file and on the basis of this petition within 15 days or 30 days, you will get the information about how a particular government official has taken a decision, how a particular government department has carried on with the money that was allocated to that department. And this newspaper article says because of RTI, we have been in a position to unearth big scams as well. For example, 2G scam, coal allocation scam, Commonwealth gave scam. And this act has been path breaking in many respects. 
But the problem that Sharad Sabarwal talks about is that whenever the Central Information Commission issues an order, whether this order is complied with or not, CIC has no role here. What is the issue? Let's say, for example, you are an individual. You have filed an application, an RTA application before a public department. And public department is refusing to give you that information, refusing to share this information. What you can do? You can approach the State Information Commission. If State Information Commission says that this public department should provide this information to this individual, then this public department has to provide that information. But what if this public department refuses further to give this information to this individual? State Information Commission or Central Information Commission, they don't have the authority, they don't have the power to enforce their orders. Maximum what they can do, they can impose a penalty on this public department, a penalty of 25,000 rupees or they can recommend disciplinary action against this official who has refused to provide that piece of information. But Sharat Sabarwal says these enforcements or these actions wherein we impose penalty or recommend disciplinary action against these officials, they may work at lower levels, but they will not work at the higher or upper levels. That is the problem with RTI. And Sharat Sabarwal also talks about the recent amendments that have been proposed to RTI. What are these amendments? Sharat Sabarwal writes that if these amendments are proceeded with, if these amendments are in fact enacted in the law, then it will further weaken the information commissions in this country. What is these? What are these proposals? Proposals number proposal number one is that CIC, who is today treated on par with election commissioners, the proposal is that we should do away with this. That means we cannot have the same equivalence, the same status, what we provide to election commissioners, we cannot provide the same status to chief election commissioner, chief information commissioner and other information commissioners. Why? Because the rules and the roles played by these two organizations are different. Election Commission is a constitutional body. Central Information Commissioners or Information Commissions are statutory bodies under the law. Another proposal is that today there is a five year term for a Central Information Commissioner or Information Commissioners. Now what the proposal is? that we will change this fixed term of five years and we will replace it with the term with the tenure as may be prescribed by the government as may be prescribed by the law that means existing five-year fixed term is to be replaced now Sharad Sabarwal says this can be misused and is liable to be misused as well that means if central information commission who today gets a five-year term if this five-year term is replaced by a term which depends upon the whims and the fancies of the government, then if this Central Information Commissioner or Information Commissioner is towing the line of the government, he can get an extension, he can get a larger term than what is prescribed right now. So this amendment, if it is passed, it will be misused and goes against the spirit of RTI in this country. Another important issue that Sharad Sabarwal raises is that there are lots of RTIs that are being filed, but these RTIs are clogging the system. For example, frivolous questions are asked from the public officials. What are these frivolous questions? Frivolous questions such as one RTI application asks the government, when will Ache Din come? And it is because of these frivolous questions that ultimately you're clogging the system. Since there is a vacancy in various information commissions as well as central information information commission and the governments are not in a position to fill these vacancies. Ultimately, the burden on the existing members is huge. And if you keep on filing these frivolous questions and RTA applications, it is going to further clog the system. 
what is then the alternative the alternative is that we should have so moto declaration so moto release of information so moto means on its own public departments public officials should release the information that means without central information commission without state information commission asking these public bodies to release the information on its own these public bodies should be in a position to so moto release the information to the public that is what is going to reduce the burden on the information commissions that is what is the heart of the matter that is what this newspaper column talks about now let us look at one prelims based question today that deals with your previous year's question paper 2017 local self government can be best explained as an exercise in democratic decentralization this is the question that i have taken because we are dealing with charter cities and how will charter cities fit in our local self government that is why i have picked this issue let's look at one mains based question today and let me try and provide the model answer as well and this question i have taken from today's hindustan times disease surveillance is key to strengthening the healthcare system in india aadhar has been criticized because aadhar has a potential of surveillance it may survey upon the people violating their privacy all the time but not all surveillances are bad disease surveillance may be good what is this disease surveillance how it is good in strengthening the healthcare system in india let us try and understand let's say for example there is an outbreak outbreak can be such as sars in hong kong severe acute respiratory syndrome or ebola in congo these are outbreaks sudden outbreaks in a disease and it is not possible for any country to deal with outbreaks which are sudden but what about other diseases which are in the nature of continuum which continuously arise in our nation for example hypertension for example heart diseases for example cancer how can we deal with these diseases this is where the disease surveillance can play a very important role not in outbreaks but in other diseases and what is this disease surveillance according to public health england this disease surveillance system is the systematic regular collection analysis interpretation and then dissemination of data for a given population and what will this data do it will detect changes on the pattern of the disease or what are the determinants which cause the disease so that action can be taken against those diseases in a planned manner that is what this disease surveillance is all about and there are two ways in which we can carry on with this surveillance either we can do this passively or we can do this actively as well what is the active and passive way of surveillance surveillance data can be collected passively how there are institutions there are facilities they over a period of time pick the data regarding the diseases and feed to the system when this data is fed to the system then they analyze this data and they come up with proper response to the diseases as and when the disease occur for example when the fever in a particular population touches 100 fahrenheit then this should be the response when the fever in a particular population exceeds 103 fahrenheit what should be the response for that this data surveillance plays a very important role or we can have active collection of this data that means there are well defined individuals well defined health workers they scan the health records of different health laboratories and then they feed this data to a system so there are two ways one is passive passive is over a period of time we will collect the data and feed to the system active is we have a well defined system we have a well defined department where health workers are trained into doing only this that they have to collect these reports feed to the system so that we can survey on the data related to these diseases and we have had some examples as well for example promed mail is there similarly epicor is there 
please pause this video and have a look at what these ProMed Mail and Epicor do. But at the same time, you should also have a piece of caution in your articles as well, in your answers as well. The caution is that these newer channels such as ProMed and Epicor, they cannot form the primary basis of a robust surveillance system in any country. No. But what they have, they have the potential to provide early warnings and added feedback, which can further strengthen such a system. Then last paragraph, collection of data is not data surveillance or disease surveillance. Collection should then proceed with collation, analysis, triangulation, and then dissemination of this data and its findings so that necessary action can be taken. For this to happen, it is important that countries establish a single national focal point for disease surveillance. Let's say, for example, what United States is doing, where there is a single center for centers for disease control and prevention, which plays a significant role in alerting the health system and educating the community on significant findings from this surveillance data. That is what you need to understand and that is how the answers are to be written for the mains based questions that are asked. That's it for now. Have a great day.